Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I chair the Hoover History Working Group here at the Hoover Institution. And uh, this week we were lucky enough to hear a paper from our colleague Matt Lowenstein. Matt's a historian of China, uh, but he brings to his uh, study of uh, Chinese history spanning uh, the 19th and 20th centuries some real financial expertise. In addition to having a PhD in history from Chicago, he also has an MBA from Columbia Business School. And before he became a professional historian, I worked as a securities analyst in Beijing and in New York covering Chinese financials. So he brings a real expertise to bear on his uh, study uh, of Chinese financial history. The paper he presented was entitled Paper Money in the Late Qing and Early Republic, 1820 to 1935. And it's a pleasure to welcome him to this short interview. And it's going to be an innovative exchange because I've brought on board uh, my colleague, Manny Rincon Cruz, uh, who helps me run the History Working Group, but also happens to know quite a bit. You guessed it about Chinese financial history. So let me kick off with the amateur's question. I think everybody kind of knows that paper money was a Chinese invention, and it predates the Qing by centuries, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, so paper money first shows up in China in the Tang Dynasty, and then um, it becomes more developed uh, later after that in the Song, and uh, reaches its first apex during the Mongolian Yuan Dynasty in something like the, the late 13th century. Uh, but um, for the most part, uh, it actually does start as private money, but for the most part, we're talking about fiduciary paper. So this is um, imperial courts issuing uh, paper money that, um, that is backed with the force of law. Uh, in the Qing, uh, you get something new. First, because there's, there's a gap. The entire uh, Ming dynasty from the uh, 14th to 17th centuries, mostly stops using paper money. They, they make a very ill-advised attempt to start do it in the beginning. Um, uh, it very quickly becomes worthless, and they switch by the mid-1400s to a fairly metalist silver and, and copper standard. Uh, during the Qing, you see, um, you see these really private merchants begin to rediscover the technology of paper money and it's much less of a, of a top-down state-run system. It's really private merchants funding, funding trade, funding agriculture, um, uh, printing their own bills, supported nothing but with nothing but their own um, their own commercial credit. Are these like bills of exchange in Western financial history, or are they different? They are like bills of exchange, and they start they start really as bills of exchange in wholesale markets, very similar to um, uh, promissory notes that you see in um, a long distance or wholesale European trade. But what you get is um, a gradual evolution from a wholesale promissory note to really a, a, a more a more retail, more money like um, uh, note, and and by the mid 19th century by the 1820s or so this paper is so liquid that it really is it really is money in in every practical sense of the word okay i'm going to throw it to the expert here well you're both experts and i'm not manny uh what would you like to ask uh matt i was going to ask matt uh to tell us a little bit more about the entities that are issuing this paper money right i think we think of uh, paper money in the West as being banknotes issued by banks. So you have demand deposits. And then on the other side, you have kind of long-term loans that are being made. What kind of entities are issuing these notes in China? I mean, do we have banks in China that look like those in the West or is it something different? That's a fantastic question. Uh, so so there you get um, most of these notes are being issued by some kind of commercial firm. Uh, in Chinese, that's a Shanghao or a Zihao. Uh, the most the most common was a dedicated financial institution known as a tianpu, a uh, cash shop, or tianzhuang, meaning something like uh, cash merchant. 
And so these, these are essentially banks. They're, they're issuing notes. They're keeping reserves of, of copper to redeem those notes uh, uh, as people come in. Um, and then after that, the second most important institutional source of this paper are grain merchants. Uh, you know, in pre any pre-industrial society, uh, agriculture is the most important sector. Um, and to uh, uh, make grain markets in, in Qing China work, you have a huge uh, number of, of specialized grain merchants, some of them doing really enormous volumes of business. And these grain merchants, when they, to uh, uh, fund agriculture and to make purchases, they're printing their own paper notes. And these notes, you know, they circulate in the market as money. Now, the grain merchants probably aren't, aren't or, or oftentimes at least, aren't redeeming their own notes. They're, um, a, if I'm a grain merchant, I will have an account with my local bank. So I will go to the countryside, issue a whole bunch of notes to the, that the peasants will take and use as money. I get my, my, my shipment of millet, my, my sorghum, my wheat. And then uh, the peasants, when they need to convert this paper into hard cash, they will go to my, my affiliate bank and, and hand it in. So when we are studying the history of financial systems, by and large, we're not doing it for its own sake. We're doing it because it helps us understand how uh, institutions like uh, the Qing Empire or the early Republic worked. What's the, the takeaway? Why does this matter? And does it give us a clue as to the enormous political changes that occurred between the Qing uh, and the Republican era? Yeah, absolutely. So the first, um, the first reason it matters is is so that we can is to understand how it is that China went um, from being for, that China essentially doubled its population. Uh, sorry, quadrupled its population and doubled its size between the Ming and the Qing. And there's um, ver uh, several competing theories about how this happened. For some scholars, there's really no structural changes in Chinese society um, as far back as the uh, oh, 13th century or so. It's just more of the same. And so to, to put it somewhat crudely, there's a Malthusian dynamic at play. For other scholars, you can't get this kind of growth um, with, without and while still sustaining standards of living, uh, which they did, without some kind of um, innovation. And so that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a a, there's a, just a tremendous amount of innovation in commercial technology in forms of economic organization that um, give the economy the dynamism that it needs to support you know, a lot more people across a much bigger territory. And you know, I think uh, ultimately this tells us more about the kind of world we're living in. Um, what you, the interesting thing about these innovations and this dynamism is the, the striking resemblance to uh, uh, economic organization you see in the West. So is it the same? Is it exactly the same? Of course not. And they're, they're, organ they're organized along, you know, very different principles and a different legal system sitting on a different instead of cultural and social assumptions. But at the same time, we get things that are recognizably a lot like Western banks issuing something that's a lot like the banknotes being seen in the West. And so this, this tells us that, um, you know, while history uh, doesn't follow any talos or, or any cycle, it is subject to some kind of, um, to some patterns. And under similar selective pressures, you're going to d develop similar um, innovations. And the the uh, 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 synonym, the analog I like to use, is convergent evolution, where you know butterflies and birds both have wings. Uh, they don't share a common uh, ancestor, but they under similar uh, selective pressures, it's just it's adaptive to develop wings. It's similarly. When you get civilizations of, of uh, sufficient scale and comp complexity, it um, uh, the the uh, exigencies of the market are going to push you to develop something like um, banking and finance. 
So the institutions that you describe were not copied uh, from Western models. Uh, but of course, later in the 20th century, there were plenty of Western financial experts, and this is really me throwing it to Manny again, who said that Chinese institutions had to become much more like Western institutions. Manny, do you buy this story that there kind of are, uh, there's a convergent evolution story, and does it get disrupted by uh, Western interference in the 20th century? Uh, I totally. I buy this. The reason I was smiling before is because Matt and I have had this discussion for a long time, and we were, in fact, uh, I think we've been exploring co authoring a paper on this question about history, right? Really spanning, I think, the, the middle path between absolute contingency, which yeah. is, I think, the modern academic take on history, which is it's all contingent, it's all random, it doesn't matter. And then the previous kind of very uh, synthetic theoretical approach of, you know, we're all going Stages. towards. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Exactly. The very Hegelian view. So uh, we very much believe in, in kind of this more iterative process where you do have randomness, but it's kind of guided by selective pressures in, in broader society. So I totally buy Matt's point, if only because <laughs> we've shared this view for, for many years now. Um, I, I also think that the uh, the trajectory of Chinese finance changes significantly, I think, after um, kind of deeper contacts with the West, right after the the opium wars. And, uh, you know, this was kind of, I think, the topic of the, the paper that I presented a couple of years ago, which was basically locating the origins of Chinese central banking in kind of this end of the 19th century moment where I think Chinese uh, rulers realized that they need uh, state-directed financial flows to support an, a type of industrialization that's really oriented towards kind of military means and kind of uh, you know, supporting uh, Chinese imperial sovereignty. And this is kind of a, a pattern that continues for a while. So the Republican regime and then the communist regime both receive significant outside uh, help and advisors. Actually, the US did send a mission in, I think, 1903 and 1904 to the Chinese empire to get them to adopt a monetary system that looks kind of like the American and Western ones as well. So they've received kind of a, a sequence of missions. And this has always been in tension with kind of Chinese regimes um, own self understanding of what their primary motives are, which is really around you know, defense oriented industrialization, right? And so a lot of the advisors that they receive are trained economists that believe in a particular type of economic efficiency and so on. Uh, and that's kind of at odds. And so there's always kind of this oscillating tension within regimes starting in, in 1895. I can't resist rounding off this discussion by dragging you uh, historians kicking and screaming into the present day, uh, because I do sometimes wonder if uh, if the great Chinese financial crisis that people have talked about for so many years might be about to happen. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but I, I watched with amazement. Uh, yes. It seemed like uh, a kind of bunch of white-shirted stormtroopers beating up a crowd of, of people outside a bank in, I think, Henan province, yes. Yes. Uh, who couldn't get their money out. And I've, I've I've rarely seen indignant depositors treated quite as brutally as as they were. Is is there uh, is there something going on in in contemporary Chinese finance that has you uh, worried and paying attention? Uh, very much so, and I, I would say um, you know it wasn't just uh, white shirted people people with fists. They had I don't know if you saw these pictures, but they they were at one point surrounded the bank with tanks. Uh, so that's. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a very <laughs> striking scene. Uh, I've been worried about the Chinese financial system for a very long time. And um, uh, particularly when you get to um, you know, rural banks like the, the Hunan uh, uh, banks um, in question, uh, and the, the particular the proximate source of the, the, the uh, insolvency of this bank is um, some is a something called a wealth management product, which I'm sure you're familiar familiar with, which have been a mainstay of the Chinese financial ecosystem for a while. And these are simply uh, off balance sheet um, shells that banks can use to hold generally uh, assets of uh, of lower quality. And so they they sell these wealth management products yielding a higher return than statutory deposits would would yield. 
and and they there's wink wink nod nod trust us depositors these are going to be fine in theory they're not allowed to say that but you know and so depositors believe that they they put their money in this wealth management project and it goes into uh building some kind of um uh you know, some kind of uh, new development zone, essentially a, a ghost city. Um, uh, although if you're lucky, like some of these cities don't even have any ghosts living there. <laughs> um, and um, the the Xi administration, to, to, to its credit, has done more than previous administrations to um, bring this system to heal. I, I do believe that it is more difficult to... Um, push assets off balance sheet than it used to be. The problem is um, they don't really have a theory of victory because they don't really want to succeed in, in uh, ending real estate speculation because that would drive GDP growth um, so low that uh, it's uh, politically infeasible. Well, this sounds a lot like another illustration of the convergent evolution story because we had yes. some mortgages and they have wealth management products and key real estate crashes and the next thing you know, people are lining up outside banks. Well, uh, if ever there was an argument for paying more attention to Chinese financial history, it's the argument that we're on the eve of China's answer to the Lehman uh, blow up. I know it won't be quite the same, but that's the point. Uh, nothing is quite the same, but there are really striking similarities. Uh, Matt, it's been a real pleasure. Manny, thank you for joining uh, this uh, experiment with the triumvirate form. Uh, we wish you luck with the book, of which this is doubtless uh, just a part, and look forward to inviting you back to the Hoover History Working Group when there's another paper to present. Thanks uh, very Neil, much. Neil, a pleasure, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Neil.